You can turn with me in your Bibles to Lamentations chapter 4 as we continue moving through this wonderful little book of the Old Testament. And I've titled this morning's message, Owning Your Sin. You see, Lamentations chapter 4 is, as we will get into this morning, an extended confession of the sins that led to the fall of Jerusalem. You'll remember as we've been studying through it that the prophet has detailed much of what the people of Judah and specifically within the city of Jerusalem endured when the Babylonians laid seeds to the city and then ultimately leveled the city and took many of the people into exile. We've seen the extreme suffering that the people endured at the hands of the Babylonians and ultimately under the wrath of God. And as we turn our attention to Lamentations chapter 4 this morning, what we see is a confession of sin, of the sin that led to that suffering. We said this way back when we began to study the book of Lamentations. Lamentations guides us on how to suffer, but it does so in a very specific way. In the book of Job, we have essentially a manual on how to faithfully suffer when you don't know why you're suffering. And in the book of Lamentations, we certainly learn general principles on how to suffer faithfully no matter what the details of your life might be. But in specifics, what we find in the book of Lamentations is how to suffer when you know exactly why you're suffering. In other words, how to suffer under the consequences of sin. And part of suffering under the consequences of sin means owning it. See, the prophet in this chapter is shepherding the people of Judah to take responsibility for their sins. And this is a vital element in suffering faithfully. Now, it's interesting as we get into this chapter and begin to look at some of these verses, it almost seems anticlimactic. So so in chapter 1, we are introduced to the whole situation and all the sin. Chapter 2, God's wrath on the people and what God's wrath on a sinful society looks like. And then in chapter 3, we began to walk with the prophet through how to deal with all of this suffering personally in our own hearts. We saw the uh, the prophet struggle through it, and then the, the, the prophet shepherded us through it. And so you get to the end of chapter 3, and we ended with with this prayer, and we need to be praying in the midst of suffering. And and then you read chapter 4, and it's almost like, what's going on here? I I thought we dealt with all this sin and wrath and judgment. I I, I thought we dealt with that. It's kind of anticlimactic to then return back to these themes of sin and wrath. Now, Part of the reason why it feels anticlimactic when you read through the book of Lamentations and come back to chapter 4, part of the reason it feels and seems anticlimactic to us is because it is anticlimactic. Remember way back when we began to study this, we, we, we learned that the book of Lamentations is structured a little bit different than what we're used to out of literature. We're used to reading something that that has a linear movement forward and and it reaches a crescendo at the end and there's a climax at the end and then everything is resolved in that final conclusion. That's the kind of uh, uh, reading and storytelling that we're used to. But the way the book of Lamentations is written, it's uh, it's what scholars would call a chiastic structure. And here's what that means for you. It means that the climax or the focal point of the book is not near the end, it's right in the middle. It's almost like a mountain. You, 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 you come up one side of the mountain, and then you go back down the other side of the mountain. And in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3 is the peak of the mountaintop. And so part of the reason why it feels anticlimactic to, to go back to these subjects of sin and wrath in chapter 4 is because we're walking back down the mountain now. And one of the things also that goes into a book that's structured in this way, it, it not only is the center the focal point, but it also means the outside edges correlate with one another. In other words, chapter 1 is going to be similar to and correlate with chapter 5, 
And then chapter 2 and chapter 4 are going to be similar to one another, and the message is going to correlate there. Which means as we enter into chapter 4, we're entering into familiar territory. Many of the themes that we discussed in chapter 2 will be revisited in chapter 4, specifically relating to God's wrath against sin. Really, chapter 4 is just an expansion of the message that we've already studied from chapter 2. Specifically, it expands the message of sin and wrath to focus in on man's guilt in that sin and wrath. You might put it this way, chapter 2 reveals God's response to sin, whereas chapter 4 reveals man's responsibility to sin. It's the same subject of sin and wrath, it's just viewed from two different perspectives. In chapter 2 you've got God's perspective and God's response to sin, and in chapter 4 now we have from man's perspective, we have man's responsibility in all of this. Or maybe you might put it this way, chapter 2 records an indictment against sin from God, whereas chapter 4 records a confession of sin before God. So it's helpful for us to understand the structure of all these things. And by the way, the structure of all these things, it's helpful to us in our own battle with sin as well when you think about it. It, it really is. I was thinking about it this week, studying through it. It, it is it is pretty interesting. The, the structure of the book of Lamentations, in a lot of ways, parallels our own battle with sin, doesn't it? All of a sudden, the Lord starts to discipline you. You're under discipline, just like the people of Judah. And all of a sudden, you begin to feel the weight of that. And as a result, you start to see sin, like we did in chapter 1. All this is happening to us because we've sinned. You start to see that sin in your own life. And then chapter 2, you start to see God's discipline and fear the Lord in the midst of your sin. I mean, that's what chapter 2 was all about, fearing the wrath of the Lord against sin. And so you see the sin and you fear the sin, and then if you're faithful in it, you'll follow the path of chapter 3 and you'll begin to deal with it in your own heart. So you've seen your sin, you fear the Lord rightly in your sin, and so you deal with that sin, and there's almost an expectation on our part that you go through steps one, two, and three, and then it's over. I can wash my hands of it, I can move on, I can go fishing, and we're all done with this. See, even as Lamentations chapter four seems anticlimactic, many times our own repentance and sin uh, repentance of sin and the battle for faithfulness seems anticlimactic, doesn't it? Wait a minute, I dealt with that sin. I saw it was wrong, I feared the Lord in it, I dealt with it, I repented of it, I don't like it anymore, and now two days later I'm tempted with it again, I just fell back into it. Or, or you know, I dealt with that sin, I repented of it, why is the Lord continuing to make me suffer under the consequences of it? That's a temptation for us, isn't it? I mean, you, you deal with these things and, and there's almost an unspoken expectation that, okay, I, I confessed it, I dealt with it, and now all the consequences and all the ongoing temptations are just going to dissipate and disappear and we're going to be able to move on. As a result of this false expectations, we're often taken off guard when after walking through the process of repentance according even to the steps of chapter 3, there remains a struggle. Wait, wait a minute. I, 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 I dealt with that sin. I did exactly what the prophet said. So how is this person still, I mean, why are they still upset with me? Why don't they trust me anymore? I mean, I, I know I sinned against them. I know I lied or gossiped about them, but, but I, I repented of that so that there shouldn't be any ongoing relational consequences, right? Of course that's not right. The fact of the matter is that sin remains an ongoing battle because it remains an ongoing temptation. And we're going to have to continue to deal with the temptation of sin and the consequences of our sin in our life. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. If you've walked through this process before and then all of a sudden you get to the other side and you're like, wait a minute, what's the deal with this? The sin keeps coming back up again. That whole repentance thing must not work. Well, that's not the problem. 
problem is your expectation. Faithfulness is an ongoing battle. And by the way, a part of that ongoing battle for faithfulness means we have to take responsibility for sin in our life. I tell this to my kids all the time and I try to not be a hypocrite and tell it to myself all the time too. But you've got to own your sin if you want to deal with it. You've got to own it. You don't want to own it. How, how many times, parents, do you have this conversation with your kids where your kids come to tell you something and they deal with it? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you were coming to confess something. You just blamed everybody else on it. Or how many times have you gone to, to deal with something? You know you're not right. You know you sinned against your spouse, so you go to them, and then you immediately start to equivocate. Well, you know, I know I shouldn't have done this, but it's been a long week at work, and I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just didn't handle that well. How about I, I, w- I was... I was a selfish sinner and I sinned against you in this specific way. That's how you own sin. Your flesh does not want to do that. Don't want to do it. But it's absolutely imperative that you do it anyway. You say, why? Why, why is this so important? Well, for one thing, as hard as it is to confess sin and own it and just fess up to it honestly and openly and then try to examine your heart to see why was that sin there. As hard as that is, God is unbelievably gracious to us in that he uses that as a means of grace in our life. God has promised when we will openly confess sin, when we'll take responsibility for our own sin, we have the promise of the Lord that he'll use that in a gracious way in our life. Now, to... To us, we might be so accustomed to this idea of confessing your sin. This, oh, well, yeah, yeah. If, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Yeah, okay, yeah. But think about it. There's nothing meritorious about confessing your sin. If I go before the Lord or other people and say, you know, you know what God said about sin? I agree with that and I see it in my own life. What have I done? I've done nothing. And yet God is so kind and gracious to us that even the, the, the mere confession of sin the Lord has promised to use for our good. And so just because it's a kind gift from the Lord, it's important for us to take advantage of. But additionally, if you don't own sin in your life, you won't leave sin in your life. If you make excuses for it all the time, all you're doing is making a provision for the, uh, uh, to the flesh so that you can come back to it later. You'll keep coming back to it until you completely own how sinful it is and how responsible you are for it. You watch your flesh. You watch it. You examine your heart. When when you're dealing with those sins, you just look at how many excuses you come up with. And then you start to pattern that out and you say, you know what? Every one of those excuses is just a provision of the flesh so that I could pick it back up later when nobody's looking. If you don't load it, you won't leave it. Additionally, if you don't own your sin, then... You're not going to trust the Lord in the midst of his discipline. You know, as a child of God, the Lord has graciously promised that if we're in, 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 entrenched in patterns of sin in our life, then he's going to discipline us to protect us from that sin. And sometimes when we don't respond to that discipline, it, it becomes more acute. We feel it more. That's a grace from the Lord. He's protecting us. But if the Lord starts to discipline you and you don't own your sin, then it's going to start to feel like God's providence in your life is unfair. Why did this happen to me? It's just not fair. Why, why do I have to go through this? Rather than owning your sin and saying, you know what, the Lord's using these circumstances in ways I don't even understand to purge me of sin. And it's hard and I don't like it, but I'm thankful for it. No, no, if you're not owning your sin, you're just going to look around at your providential life and you're going to, and instead of growing in sanctification, you're going to be entrenched in self-pity. Poor me, nobody understands me, nobody likes me, the Lord is against me, I don't understand this. Those are the statements of somebody who has not owned sin in their own life and taken responsibility for their transgressions. If you don't own sin, you're going to have a hard time trusting God with the circumstances in your life. Additionally, if you don't own your sin, you're not going to be sanctified by God's discipline. 
That's what God's after. God, God, God is not motivated in his perfect wisdom and providence by your comfort. He's motivated by your holiness. What you need is not comfort and leisure. What you need is holiness. Now the Lord is kind and knows there's only so much we can handle. And he mixes in some comfort and leisure as common graces to us. And I love it. And it's wonderful. But that's not the ultimate. You know, the world around us is living for the weekend because why? They can get a little leisure. We're living for the weekend. Why? Because it's the Lord's Day and we come together and we receive His grace. That's what we need. We need sanctification. We need holiness. But here's the thing. If you don't recognize the sin in your life and take responsibility for it, then you are going to short circuit the process of sanctification in your life. If part of God's sanctifying work is to purge you of sinfulness and you refuse to own your sinfulness, then you're going to be an impediment to your own growth in the Lord. And you're going to miss out on God's ultimate purpose for your life. That's the danger. And that's part of the reason why the prophet returns to the subjects of sin and wrath in chapter 4. So the prophet in Lamentations 4 comes back to these subjects to remind the people of their responsibility. To remind them, look, even if you heed all the words of chapter 3 and you walk through this process, you're still going to have to endure the temporal consequences of your sin. You're still exiled. The Babylonians still won. Prophet's walking them through all this and he, he wants to make sure that they are not tempted to think that God is unfair. They're not tempted to look around them and say, you know, Yahweh didn't keep up his end of the bargain. This is a reminder from the prophet. No, no, no. You are responsible for everything that happened because of your sin. This is exactly what God warned of. In other words, the people needed to accept God's discipline and take responsibility for their sins, which, friend, that's true of all of us. It's true of all of us. See, Lamentations chapter 4 confronts us with our responsibility to own sin in our life. Specifically, this chapter emphasizes three aspects of sin that we need to own. Three aspects of sin that we need to own. First of all, in verses 1 through 10, we're reminded that we need to own the depth of our sin. You, you need to get real and take responsibility for just how pervasive and deep the patterns of sin are in your life. We love, again, to equivocate on this. I didn't sin, I made a mistake. I don't have patterns of sin. I just have bad habits. You see, to truly understand the wrath that they were enduring, Judah needed to understand the depth of their sin. And so that they wouldn't be tempted to view their punishment from God as unjust, they needed to understand uh, the reality of how deep their sin went. They needed to see that the severity of their punishment matched the depth of their sin. And that's what the prophet points out to them. In fact, notice in these first uh, four verses here, four or five verses, how God's rejection of Judah matched the depth of their sinful rejection of him. Verse 1 says, How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold is changed, the holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious sons of Zion, worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. Here we see something of the depth of God's rejection of the people. The, it, the prophet says that the, the gold has grown dim, the pure gold has changed. What's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the gold that was used in the building of the temple. That's the significance here. In 1 Kings chapter 6, we read a description of, of some of the gold that was used in the building of the temple. And it says in 1 Kings 6 verse 20, listen to this. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high, and he overlaid it with pure gold. Now, if your cubit conversion chart is not quite up to date, 
it doesn't really matter. You're getting the point. There was a lot of gold there, right? It says, He also overlaid an altar of cedar, and Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary, and overlaid it with gold, and he overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. That's a lot of gold. Now some of that here and there had been plundered and used up, but there was still a lot of gold in the temple. In fact, you remember King Hezekiah? The Lord granted Hezekiah a reprieve. You know, you're going to die, then he gets a reprieve, he gets some extra time. And before they were the enemies, while Assyria was still the enemy, uh, some folks came from Babylon, an envoy came from Babylon, and Hezekiah gave them the royal treatment and even showed them, what? All the gold. So when Babylon becomes the world superpower, Somebody must have said in a meeting somewhere, we got to make sure to stop by Jerusalem because there is a lot of gold there. In fact, that's exactly what happened. In Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 19, we, we read a description of the plundering of the city. And it says, also the small bowls and the fire pans and the basins and the pots and the lampstands and the dishes for incense and the bowls for drinking for drink offerings. What was of gold the captain of the guard took away as gold. That's what Lamentations chapter 4 is talking about. The, the, the consecrated elements of the temple had been removed. Additionally, it says in verse 1 that the holy stones lie scattered at the head of every street. Well, just as there was consecrated gold used to build the temple, they were consecrated stones. In fact, in that same section of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 5, it it talks about how Solomon had special stones quarried and, and cut and consecrated to lay the foundation of the temple and to build up the temple. And again, in Jeremiah 52, it says that that the Babylonians came through and they burned the whole thing down. They knocked it all down. In fact, to, to use the words of Jesus, not one stone was left on another. So the consecrated stones, the consecrated gold, it, it, it's done away with. And then, verse 2 the precious sons of Zion worth their weight in fine gold. This is the people of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, which were worth even more than the consecrated elements of the temple. They too were regarded as earthen pots. What's an earthen pot? It's just a clay pot. And you know what happens when you have a clay pot and it breaks? You just go out and bury it in the trash heap. This is common language in the scripture by the way if you're familiar with Romans chapter 9 the apostle Paul is using the same kind of imagery the clay pots are the ones that are 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 disposable and often disposable unto wrath in other words they went from special chosen people a, a, a a, a, a nation of priests is what God called them to be to being cast off By the way, is what God said He was going to do. In Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 11, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, So I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Topheth because there will be no place else to bury. In other words, in these first couple of verses in Lamentations chapter 4, The prophet is describing the the absolute rejection of this people. God destroyed the consecrated symbols of his relationship with them and he cast them out like broken pots. And that was the reality of it. And if the people were tempted to distrust God in that or, 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 or claim, boy, that wasn't fair, well... The prophet goes on in verses 3 through 5 to show them that God's rejection of them only matched their sinful rejection of him and his covenant. 
It says in verse 3, even jackals offer the breast, they nurse their young, but the daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. Here, here the prophet is describing from God's perspective uh, how children were treated by the culture and how uh, how parents were uh, uh, generally treating their children. And, and the idea here is that the jackals do a better job of raising their children than my people. I mean, remember in the book of Deuteronomy, this was a big part of the covenant. Don't just receive the covenant and say you're going to follow it, but you pass it down to the next generation. You teach them these things. You teach them uh, my covenant. And, and, and even the jackals, they provide for their children, but you're not even doing that. He compares the way they treated children to the, to the ostrich of the field, which may not mean much to us, but from a biblical perspective, this was a stinging indictment of their care for children and the way their society raised children. Most likely, the prophet here had Job chapter 39 in mind. Just listen to what Job 39 verse 14 says about the ostrich and how an ostrich would care for its young. It says, For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain, she has no fear. It's it's vanity the way she parents her children and she does so cruelly. That's the ostrich's way of parenting. And what the prophet's saying is, look, the Lord laid down for you a covenant and he laid down for you a pattern for how you were to pass that down to the next generation. And you have rejected that, choosing instead the wisdom of the cruel ostrich. By the way, just this is stunningly familiar to what we see going on in our own country. It... it, it, in fact, just one of the men in the church and I were meeting for a discipleship breakfast yesterday and encouraging one another, and a conversation was, was, was so beneficial to both of us that we left the table and went outside and sat outside the restaurant at the bench and talked for another while. And, and while, while we were sitting there, we witnessed a, a mother screaming at her child, which I understand that from time to time, but in a demeaning, uh, 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 expletive filled fashion the kind of language that i can't imagine ever coming out of my mouth this mother was screaming at her child who must have been three and a half or four years old you know words that would make a movie r-rated and she's berating her child with those words and i couldn't help but think about what i had been studying from this passage to say that's the ostrich's way of raising a child That's what the people were guilty of. And and it goes even further. It says in verse 4, The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children were starving to death. They weren't being cared for. Additionally, it says the children beg for food. In all likelihood, uh, there's, there's... well, I should say in all probability, there's two categories of children being discussed here. One is that the, the natural born children, a mother was not even taking care of her own children in her own house. But additionally, with all the people who died, you had a slew of orphans in the city of Jerusalem that were begging for food. And it says no one gives it to them. And so in chapter two, we read of the starvation of the children and how awful that was. But here we see that that the starving children was made even worse by the selfishness of the parents. I mean, this is what God considers to be true and undefiled religion, the care of widows and orphans, James says. And and while that's a New Testament uh, uh, verse, it reflects the, the abiding principle that God expects from His people. It wasn't a new thing, in other words. 
And yet in Jerusalem, which was supposed to be the city of God, the orphans were starving to death and and whatever little food was left, the, the adults were selfishly hoarding to themselves. That's why God rejected him. Verse 5, it says, Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. The purple, of course, represents extravagance and power. Now they're wallowing in the sorrows of the ash heaps. Why? Because God stopped caring for them as a father. And why did he stop caring for them as a father? Because they rejected him in the way that they were raising up and caring for the next generation. The children should have been the last people to starve to death, not the first people to starve to death. No, the people of Judah couldn't look at God's rejection of them and say, that's not fair. Additionally, uh, verses 6 through 10 continue to show the depth of their depravity and, and demonstrates that, that God's anger against the people matched their abomination before God. Verse 6 says, For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. Now, a couple things. The word here, chastisement, it's literally the word iniquity. And the significance here is that their iniquity and the punishment for that iniquity, which is all wrapped up together, was greater than that of Sodom's, you know, of Sodom and Gomorrah. The depth of... God's anger towards Jerusalem outpaced God's wrath poured out on Sodom. You say, is that even possible? Yeah, it's possible. Remember what Jesus told of the cities? It was it Tyre and Sidon? Your judgment, your wrath will be even worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Is it possible? It is possible, and it happened. Because in addition to the gross abominations that we'll read about in a minute that were going on in the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem also had the truth. They had the covenant promise. They had all these Old Testament signs of the covenant. They, they had God's grace and they had it in the form of God's law and they rejected Him straight up. As a result, their punishment was worse than Sodom's. You say, in what way? Well, Sodom was overthrown in a moment. It was done. No hands were wrung for her. Now, This is, uh, uh, there are a number of places in Lamentations chapter 4 that contain some of the most complicated and difficult Hebrew to translate in the whole Old Testament, or at least it seemed like to me this week. (laughs) And so the English translators here did their best here trying to say, explain what's going on, that no hands were wrung for her. But, But I think the better idea is no human hands were used in their destruction. In other words, when God poured out his wrath on the cities of the valley and Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he did it directly. He just poured out that wrath and boom, they were, they were destroyed. When God chose to pour out his anger on the people of Judah and Jerusalem, he did it through the instrument of the Babylonians and by their hands, the people endured the punishment of the Lord. And what the prophet is saying is, that's worse. That's worse. Part of the reason why it's worse is it didn't happen in a moment. In fact, notice the effects of it. In verse 7, it says, Her princes were purer than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Now, that's not the way we would describe dudes in our culture today. <laughs> but just suffice it to say, the, these men uh, uh, were the best of the best. Actually, the word princes here. Uh, It's likely referring to those who had taken a Nazarite vow and dedicated themselves to the Lord. They were under a specific diet that the Lord had promised to bless. And before you turn there to the, you know, the section numbers where it talks about the Nazarite diet saying, oh, maybe I should try that. It was for a specific time and place that God promised to bless that diet. So no, 
No, no best-selling books, The Nazarite Diet, out of our congregation. Please, if it hasn't been written yet, please don't be the one who wrote it. Because the point is, it didn't work here. When God removed his blessing from it, what happened to them? They, they were beautiful by the standard of their day, but, verse 8, now their face is blacker than soot. The, the, the blackness probably refers to the discoloration that takes place through starvation. They are not recognized in the streets. I was just reading a book about the Revolutionary War and it had a, a, a letter that was written by one of the soldiers and he was walking through a specific town and he saw this soldier who was so bloodied and mangled. He had uh, barely any clothes that were left. They were tattered. He had no shoes. He was frostbit all over. And he walked right up by the guy and didn't realize until the guy grabbed him that it was his brother. It was unrecognizable. That's what this is describing. They're not recognizable. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become dry as wood. And so kind of the cream of the crop, if you will, went from being clean and blessed to unclean and cursed. Verse 9 says, Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger. In other words, it was better for those who died at the hands of the Babylonians when they finally overran the city than those who were stuck here afterwards and starved to death. Those who wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. Look, you know what this describes? This describes God's anger on the people. It was a complete removal of blessing. You got a guy like Daniel who goes into the Babylonians and, and, and is a faithful man. And he's being asked to eat things that are against the old covenant law. And he says, I'm not going to do that. And so what happened? He was blessed with good health from that. That's not necessarily the diet that he chose. It was his faithfulness to the Lord that the Lord blessed. Now, for those who stayed in disobedience, what do you have? You have a complete removal of that in the anger of God. And again, if the people were tempted to say, well, that's not fair. The prophet reminds them the depth of God's anger towards you that's being poured out. It matches the depth of your own abomination before the Lord. Look at verse 10. This is the most stunning verse in the entire book. It says the hands of compassionate women. So, so the hands of those who should have been maternal in caring for the young. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. Think about that. They became their food. Now, that phrase there, they became their food. Just to make sure you know it wasn't just the mothers. The word their in Hebrew is masculine. Everybody was involved in it. Mom, dad, men, women. During the destruction of the daughter of my people, what did they do? They ate the children. They sacrificed their own children to the God of their own belly. Again, by the way, it's not hard to come up with illustrations of that from our own culture, is it? It's an abomination. It's kind of mistreatment of God's precious little ones. Discussing when the Gentile nations did it and sacrificed children to their false gods. It was disgusting when the Israelites did it to feed their own bellies. And it's disgusting in our own culture when children are killed in the womb to serve the God of convenience and personal lust. It's an abomination. And that's the point here. The punishment against Judah was worse than the punishment against Sodom because their abominations were even worse. By the way, just as an aside, it's kind of scary to live in a culture that's combined the abominations of Sodom with the abominations of Jerusalem, isn't it? But that's the point here. Ezekiel, in his prophecy, elaborates on this a little bit for us. In Ezekiel chapter 16, 
verses 47 through 48, it says this. Not only did you walk in their ways, speaking of Sodom with her daughters, not only did you walk in her ways and do according to their abominations, within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, declares Yahweh God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. That was the depth of their abomination. If Judah was tempted to question the righteousness of God and His outpouring of wrath against them, they needed only to step back and look at the depth of their own sins. Now for us, it's unlikely that our sins are of the same nature as Judah's. At least as a congregation, as a culture, our sins are right in line and step with what Judah was doing and what Sodom did. But for us here today as a congregation, it's unlikely that our sins are of the same nature as Judah's. But understand that our sins are still an abomination before a holy God. Our sins go much deeper than we often admit, don't they? We are so selfish. We're, we, we, we are so separated from the image of Christ and the holiness that we're called to. We're thankful for the grace that forgives us of that. We're thankful for the work of Christ that deals with our sin and provides us with righteousness so that we can be right with God even though we're sinners. But that doesn't change the depth of our sin. Deep in our hearts, we frequently reject God and practice sins that are an abomination to His holiness. This is a reality that we must own. It's a reality you must own. You have been completely corrupted by sin. That's the truth of God's Word. You need to own that. You need to own the depth of your sin. Additionally, You need to own the consequences of your sin. We see this in verses 11 through 16. Here we're reminded to own the consequences of our sin. You see, to submit to their punishment from God, Judah needed to accept that their suffering was a consequence of their sin. And the prophet made sure to show them that this punishment from God was a result of their disobedience to God. In fact, notice in verses 11 and 12, the divine consequences that are laid out here. Verse 11 says, The Lord gave full vent to His wrath. He poured out His hot anger, and He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. Yeah, after you read verse 10, you understand why He did that, don't you? I mean, God gave full vent to, to his anger. In other words, there was no mitigating grace. God had disciplined the people of Israel before this in their history, but it was always a measured discipline. It it was always a discipline that included a certain measure of of grace to go along with it. But now, chapter 2, verse 11 says, or excuse me, verse 21 says that this was a discipline without pity. There was no mercy to mitigate it. Full vent. It was brought to completion. It was accomplished fully. Nothing was held back. God God gave them these kind of road barrier disciplines to try to slow their sin down. And they just drove right through them at 90 miles an hour. And so where do they find themselves? Under the full vent of God's anger. Now, by the way, just as an aside, this is a this is a sobering reminder, now is the best time to deal with sin. If the Lord is dealing with you just through conviction, don't you push that conviction down and try to suppress it and not deal with it. Deal with it now. Because if you don't deal with it now, according to His normal means of grace and according to the conviction of the Spirit, then what's going to happen is He's going to bring discipline in your life. And if you refuse to submit to that discipline, that hardship he brings in your life, then he's going to bring more and more and more until he crushes you under it and he crushes your sin. 
Can I just tell you, child of God, it would be much easier for you if right now you would deal with your sin, own it, take responsibility of it, depend on God's means of grace to grow through it, Uh, uh, find other believers around you to keep you accountable, come to the leadership of the church to deal with whatever it is. Israel did not do that. And so they find that found themselves under the full vent of God's wrath. It says that he poured out his hot anger. You see, the fall of Jerusalem was a satisfaction of God's holy wrath on this earth. And this is just a preview of the hot anger and full wrath that will be experienced by sinners in hell who did not repent and did not turn to Christ. It says, verse 11, that he kindled a fire in Zion. He prepared the fire. He made it hotter. They stored up wrath and he was ready to deliver that wrath. And by the way, this had to be God. When Jerusalem fell, everyone knew this was divine judgment. Look at verse 12. It says that the kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. In other words, nobody thought Jerusalem would fall. The last superpower, the Assyrians, who by the way, were more brutal than the Babylonians, when the Assyrians came through, they weren't able to conquer the city of Jerusalem. The the nations around, all the people around looked at Jerusalem and said, well, there's a city that can't fall. That, That their God has protected that city. But then what happened? The Babylonians came and leveled the city. The fact that the city fell to the Babylonians was clearly the result of divine punishment. And everybody knew it. These were divine consequences for their sin. And they were deserved consequences. Look at verse 13. It says, This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priest who shed in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. This was for their sin. Now, the prophet here focuses on the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And the idea is, if even the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders, were that sinful before God, then what hope was there for the rest of the people? Now again, I've been dropping these hints along the way, not so subtle hints, but this is another area where it is not hard to look around at our culture and see the parallels, is it? All you got to do is flip through the TV station and find the Duda channel and you'll find charlatans and false prophets just like these. In fact, the primary, most vocal and influential spiritual leaders in our country today, the vast majority of them, should be condemned as heretics. So the prophet is focusing on the sins of these spiritual leaders as representative of the entire nation. We learned in chapter 2, verse 14, they did not warn the people of sin. What led to the fall of Jerusalem? Sin. What did the prophets and the priests, at least the false ones, what did they never do? They never warned the people of sin. And the prophets, they were supposed to represent God to the people. And the priests, they were supposed to represent the people to God. This is how communion with God took place in the Old Covenant. God spoke through the prophets, and the people were able to go to God and speak through the priest. Well, if that's cut off, that means communion, relationship with God is cut off. See, instead of leading the people before the throne of God, and and instead of representing God's word to the people, instead, these hypocrites were, were motivated to shed blood, the blood of the righteous. And Jeremiah knew this, by the way. They tried to kill him. Jesus alluded to this when he said to, to the wicked people of his day that, that your forefathers killed the prophets. What do you mean you would accept the prophets? Your forefathers killed the prophets. When, when Jeremiah came and said, look, we've got to give up. We've got to forfeit because that's what God wants us to do. We've got to take our discipline. The prophets came in and said, he is a traitor. He's unpatriotic. He's unpatriotic. 
And they chose to lie to the people instead. As one commentator put it, they chose to be blind patriots who put country over principle. Or maybe to put it more specifically, they put their, their national pride over their devotion to God. They were hypocrites. And God unmasked them as hypocrites. Look at verse 14. They wandered, as a result of God's discipline, they wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. In other words, God exposed them. For for a long time, they were able to keep up the ruse that they spoke for God, that they were holy men. But now they had been revealed to be totally blind, that is without truth, and totally defiled, that is unholy before God. They were unmasked and exposed. And now the people who used to willingly follow them, nobody wanted to touch them. I don't want any piece of that. Verse 15, the people cry, away, unclean, people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. People said among the nations that they should not stay with us. Or they should stay with us no longer. The idea here is that that they became so detestable. Their lies were so exposed. Because they kept saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And they keep saying, look, God will get us through this. We're fine. We don't have to repent. They were so exposed that the people kicked them out. Those who were left after the exile, those who were remaining, these guys were walking around, and they got kicked out by their own people. So they had to go find other places to live. But even when they went among the Gentiles, they were so exposed as hypocrites, they were so detestable that not even the Gentiles would receive them. Look at verse 16. Who did it? It says, the Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. You see, it was the Lord who exposed their hypocrisy. And this, by the way, is what always happens to false teachers. God always exposes them. Sometimes he waits until a judgment after death. But usually he exposes them for what they are in this life. He didn't regard them anymore. In other words, he didn't show his face to them anymore. This is actually the exact opposite if you compare it to the ironic blessing. You know, may, may the Lord's face shine upon you and, and this blessing, if you compare it, it's the exact opposite. They were cursed. They had recited that ironic blessing so many times as priests. Now they're, they're, they were experiencing the exact opposite. You say, well, what, why does the prophet focus in on these priests and prophets so much, these false prophets so much? This is an indictment against the people. Because the people, Jeremiah kept warning them and warning them and warning them, but they rejected Jeremiah the true prophet and they followed these wicked hypocrites who eventually were exposed. In other words, all of this was a reminder to the people, this is the bed you made and you're lying in it now. And this is sobering. You see, even the consequences of sin that aren't immediately obvious to us now, God will eventually expose and punish those sins. Even those sins that may be hidden, it's not like the Lord doesn't know about them. There are always consequences to sin and those consequences come directly from God and they are completely deserved. That's what we see here. And this is an important message in our own day because there are millions of people living in their sins as if there are no consequence. We know that there are consequences not only in this life, but we know that there are consequences in the age to come. Eternal consequences. We also know that the only hope that we have in the face of the ferocious full vent of God's wrath is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our only hope. You're a hypocrite and I'm a hypocrite. We all have hypocrisy. We all have sin in our life. 
We've got to recognize that. We've got to recognize the consequences that come from that. And that has to drive us back to Christ to believe on Him for the salvation of our souls. That's our only hope and that's our only message, by the way. And we need that and there are a lot of people around us that need that as well. This is the reality that we must own. There are consequences that you deserve for your sin. Now, there's one more aspect of sin that we need to make sure that we own from this passage. I'm just going to introduce it to you this morning. And we're going to spend a little bit of extra time on this one next week because I think it's possibly the most subtle aspect of sin that we need to take responsibility for. But I think it's also the most important aspect of sin that we need to take responsibility for. And that is the idolatry of our sin. In verses 17 through 20, the prophet is reminding us that we need to own the idolatry of our sin. Behind every sin, whether it was the people of Judah in the book of Lamentations or in our own life, there are all kinds of idols of the heart that drive us to pursue things other than obedience to Christ. All kinds of idols. What's an idol? Idol is something that, that you worship instead of the Lord. An idol is something that you devote yourself to instead of the Lord. An idol is something that you become infatuated with and, and serve rather than serving the Lord. I mean, I just, I just poked my head in this morning to to see what was going in, uh, going on on a couple of the children's Sunday school classes, and man, this was this did my heart well. But one of the teachers was talking with the the kids about the fear of man. That's awesome when your church is 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 dealing with young hearts at that level, isn't it? I mean, we praise the Lord for that, but but the fear of man, that's just an idol of significance before other people. I want other people to think well of me. Well, what about what the Lord thinks of you? (laughs) Have you displaced that as the chief end in your life to bring glory to God and please Him? Look, you want to see an idol of the heart, specifically in terms of the fear of man on display, just go to the roller skating rink, okay? I'll tell you what, you watch people fall down at the roller skate rink, And the first thing that they do is not to check themselves for injury. The first thing that they do is not to call for help. The first thing that they do is immediately their head goes on a swivel and they start to look around to see who just saw that. Right? And then it doesn't matter how bad it hurts. The second thing they do is hop right back up. Man, I hope nobody saw that. Why? You're embarrassed. Why? Well, You don't want to look like a fool in front of other people. Those get pretty subtle and tricky, don't they? That's why I want to spend a little extra time on it next week. I think we're, I think we're all on the same page that boiling our children is an abomination. I think we can all agree with that. Even if our culture struggles with that in certain areas. But when it comes to digging through the idols of the heart that can often plague us, that's when it takes a little bit more thought. So we're going to jump on that next week. We're going to see the, the, the idols that Israel ran to instead of Yahweh. And we're also going to deal with some of the common idols that we often want to run to instead of the Lord. And in all this, we come back to the theme of this chapter. We've got to own our sin. And the, the kind promise that we have from the Lord is that when we own our sin, He deals with us according to grace and helps us in our sin. And that's a promise that we can uh, rest our faith in. We pray with me? Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word and we thank You for these truths. Uh, Lord, these are, these are sobering and difficult realities. So we pray that as we study through these things, that you would give us humble and soft hearts to receive them. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you even on this Lord's Day for giving us the church as a wonderful means of grace to help us and encourage us.
Uh, Lord, I pray even as we uh, deal with difficult ministry situations or deal with sin in our own heart or deal with frustrations of life, Lord, help us to be encouraged today by the grace and guidance that you continue to provide for us. Lord, we love you and we love you because you first loved us. And we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.